don't know how it picked uh, Chris as the person to uh, uh, be the main person. Actually, let's ask Tierra. Uh, Daniel, I, once you once you start talking, it, it'll it'll jump to whoever's talking. So everyone else just should mute, and Good. then yeah. you'll. Okay, when, when when it's actually time for me to talk, I think um, now uh, for the moment, could you leave it as um, uh, the gallery view? Yep. Daniel, I, once you once you start talking, it, it'll it'll jump to whoever's talking. So everyone else should mute. And yeah, then Some, you, somebody has not it, muted. It's me. actually time for me to talk. So I, I think uh, Chris, is that you? You make make sure you somebody I don't know uh, has has YouTube muted, or maybe that was just my own feedback coming through. I don't know. I have YouTube muted now, so it's not going to be uh, bothering us anymore. Okay, looks like we still have three minutes officially till we're supposed to start. I want some way to hide the picture of myself on YouTube, but I, uh, I can't figure out how to do that without hiding the chat too. Ah, there we go, pop out chat, beautiful. Now I no longer need to look at myself. I recommend everyone do that. Okay, it is officially start time. So hello everyone uh, who's tuning in. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is an Emory TMLS workshop, Theory and Modeling of Living Systems, the latest in a series of ongoing workshops. Thank you very much to our administrator, Tierra Ward, for organizing and to the uh, NSF Physics of Living Systems Student Research Network uh, for support. Um, we've got uh, another one coming up next week. Don't forget that. And there will be additional ones every month 
throughout the following months. So please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll get notifications of all of the meetings as they come. This month, we're changing up the format a little bit, uh, split into two sessions, as I mentioned. Uh, so we'll see how that works. Um, another way that this uh, this one's a little bit different um, from, from previous ones is uh, this session in particular is uh, much more focused on a particular topic, uh, link selection. So uh, why did we choose to do that? Um, so we believe that this is a quite a prevalent phenomenon in nature. Um, and we believe that both for empirical and theoretical reasons, you can see uh, throughout many species that there is a correlation between recombination and genetic diversity in the genome, which is what you'd expect under link selection, not under demographic uh, sources of variability. And also theoretically, some simple models suggest that uh, often drift should be uh, very slow acting and uh, link selection should be um, relatively strong, at least in parts of the frequency range. But um, part of the reason why we wanted to have this focus workshop is that's an open question. It's, 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 it's controversial exactly how, uh, how, how prevalent it is. And so we wanted to, to hear some discussion of that. And then also people haven't really re wrestled with the consequences uh, for evolution if link selection is super prevalent. So, I mean, in some ways it acts like demographic noise. And so there's this uh, temptation to just uh, accommodate it as a changed effective population size. But uh, as we'll see in some of these talks, in other ways, it acts very differently, both you know across the genome and across time. So ultimately, uh, we know that we can't capture it with just a single um, effective population size. And I've been you know, yelling about that for a while, but uh, what, what the real question is, okay, well, how can you capture it? How can we describe link selection? What, what's a theory that would give us a reasonable description of it? And that one is a question that I think that we don't even know. Not only do we not know the answer to it yet, we as a field have not really faced up to the need to answer it. So in a way, this, this um, session is meant as a little bit of a call to arms uh, to take this question seriously. Um, all right, so a little, bit, a little bit more about the uh, format of the workshop. So uh, another way that this is different is that we're very excited that this one is this session is focused uh, on the work of uh, early career investigators. Um, and uh, we've given them uh, slightly longer than in previous sessions uh, in previous workshops to talk. So now um, while the talk slots are remaining uh, 20 minutes, it's going to be a, a roughly 15 minute talk and then five minutes for questions afterwards. Um, don't worry, uh, there'll still be extra time at the end for discussion. So if you don't get your chance to get your question answered um, in those five minutes, hang on to it or just put it in there. We'll, we'll get to it at the end, hopefully. Um, how do you ask questions? That is right there in the YouTube chat window. You can see it's people are already doing that. We are participating. Um, Yep, don't expect the speaker to be watching it, but uh, the rest of us will be will be taking a look and uh, communicating your questions to the speaker. Uh, we will also be watching to make sure that you're all on your best behavior. If you're a jerk, you're game banned. Um, yeah, and then we'll also be using that same uh, chat feature uh, for uh, for the discussion at the end. So I think that is um, everything I want to say, despite the fact that I gave myself 10 minutes to talk. So now I think we should, uh, we should wait a few minutes um, just in case people took the schedule seriously and uh, aren't you know, deliberately are waiting to, to avoid hearing me talk. So I'm going to wait um, two minutes, and then I will uh, introduce our first speaker, or three minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, I've been reminded that there is another plug uh, that I should be making for the Worldwide uh, Physics of Life seminar uh, list. I will drop the link into the chat right now. Oh, and Ilya did it exactly the same time. So now you have the link twice. So our seminars are listed on there as well as uh, many others. Okay, so <laughs> our uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Christelle Freis. That's my best attempt. Um, currently at IST Austria and moving soon to a permanent position at CNRS. And she's going to be talking about multi-locus barriers to integration between hybridizing species, sex chromosomes versus autosomes. So to um, I won't. I won't go into detail about it. I will let her uh, describe her own talk. So, Chris, uh, can you go ahead and uh, share your screen, please? That looks good. Okay, take it away. Okay. Great. So. Uh... Thanks, uh, first, um, Daniel and Matt, for the invitation. And um, so today, during my talk, I will try to show you that uh, different regions in the genome, uh, I expected to maintain species differences um, to a greater or lesser extent, and that this is due to link selection to reproductive barriers. So first, um, Aldane, in the early 20th century, uh, made a very important observation for the study of speciation. So he showed that in uh, crosses between two species, if in F1 hybrids only one sex is stable or inviable, it's always or nearly always heterogametic sex, which are males in an XY system and females in a ZW system. So uh, subsequent work has uh, been done and uh, tried to generalize this rule to many taxa. And actually, 81% um, of the studies obeys Adam's rule. So it's a very important rule in speciation that suggests an important role of sex chromosomes. Most recently, and maybe more uh, directly um, connected to the topic today, um, there is a second emerging pattern, um, which is the fact that sex chromosomes have higher molecular divergence than autosomes. So this has been typically shown in um, genome scan of divergence, where people look at uh, regions of high FST. And this plot represents a meta-analysis by Pressgraph who looked at 101 pair of species. And as you can see, it's very pretty clear that um, sex chromosome um, differentiation on them uh, always exceed that on the autosomes. However, um, um, one should be cautious when interpreting this FST scan alone, because you have many factors that can affect FST, whether or not gene flow occurred during divergence between the species. 
And so a simple uh, factor is just the fact that uh, sex chromosomes have a lower effective population size compared to autosomes, typically three quarter. And so this would inflate FST. But even when you take a mutual process into account, you can have, for example, recurrent selective sweeps on the sex chromosome that will decrease diversity within species and so also inflate FST on the sex chromosome compared to the autosomes. But still, these two patterns um, still suggest a major role for sex chromosome in speciation. And so different theories has been proposed to explain that. So the first two theories um, rely on the invisibility of the sex chromosome, which is the fact that uh, in an XY system, in males, they only carry a single copy of the sex chromosome, the X. So the faster X theory suggests that this emisigosity uh, promotes a faster accumulation of reproductive barrier on the sex chromosomes relative to the autosomes. And this works only if these reproductive barriers first arise within species as recessive beneficial mutations. On the other hand, the dominant theory um, suggests that you can have as many barriers on the two types of chromosome, but they are more deleterious on the sex chromosomes. And this is because uh, if incompatibility between species interact in a recessive way, then um, this, their deleterious effect will be unmasked in the sex chromosome in the heterogametic sex. The final um, uh, explanation, one of the explanations that is directly connected to the topic today is the fact that um, the absence of recombination uh, between the X and the Y in the heterogametic sex will reduce recombination to two thirds that of the autosomes. And so that um, will increase link selection. So you will have an enhanced effect of the reproductive barriers on their chromosomal surrounding. And so the link neutral marker will be um, impeded in, in their flow between species. And so this is typically the barrier to neutral gene flow introduced by Barton and Beckson in 96. So we can um, see different limits to these theories, um, especially the fact that the faster X theory has been poorly supported so far. And uh, the dominance theory uh, has only been tested in Josephina or mice, so um, because it's quite hard to test it empirically. Then um, the, the issue with this genome scan of divergence, as I said before, is that you have many factors that can confound uh, the interpretation of this type of scan. And so a new method that try to directly uh, infer integration rate based, based on um, a model of association uh, may be uh, important to develop. And finally, the Adams rule really um, look at the effects of incompatibilities in the lab on the first hybrid generations. But what really matters, I think, for speciation is uh, really the effect of these incompatibilities on the long run in nature um, and uh, on the effect as a barrier to gene flow between species. So all the caveats um, uh, were the reason why I wanted to design this project. Um, which uh, is really about quantifying the role of sex chromosomes as barriers to interspecies integration. And so in practice, I would like to, um, to estimate integration rate between species at the level of autosomes and sex chromosomes. And so during this talk, I will show you some theoretical predictions for those traits, but in the near future, I really want to compare them to empirical estimate by statistical inferences. So um, from a theoretical point of view, what has been done so far is really focused on single locus model. So you have uh, typically you model um, uh, a single barrier or pair of incompatibilities, and you look at their effect uh, to the flow of a neutral marker between species. But speciation is a complex process and probably multigenic. So that's why we really wanted to extend this type of model to a multi locus model of barriers to gene flow. So to do that, um, I model um, two incompletely isolated species um, that hybridize, and upon hybridization, um, you will introgress genomic block from one species into the other at a steady rate. So each genomic block is composed of reproductive barriers, one ear, that are deleterious in the recipient, recipient genetic background. 
but you also have a neutral marker, the zero here, which is linked to the selected block, but that can escape uh, selection against migrant by recombination. So not, uh, you, you have to note here that uh, all this machinery has already been uh, um, developed by Barton and Dexter in the 80s. So the idea was simply to extend this work to the sex chromosomes. So for that, I modeled um, XY males and XX females. And I consider so the autosomes uh, to become part with the sex chromosomes in pink here. And I only focus on the X and not the Y chromosome uh, that is neglected in the model. Then the main assumptions are the following. Uh, we neglect mutation, there is one way migration, and importantly, the introduced genomic blocks are short and rare. In that way, um, the population is mainly uh, composed by individuals which carries a single copy of the introgressed block, which is heterozygous, and this is important then for the analytical predictions. Uh, regarding the sex chromosome, we assume no recombination at all between the X and the, uh, and the Y in the heterogametic sex, and uh, it is entirely hemizygous. So this model is very simple, but it's quite general, and we can apply it to XY or ZW system, even though I would just take XY as an example. And you can also um, look at sex specificities by adding some sex bias parameters. So what we did first is to obtain a first order approximation for the integration rate of the incompatible alleles uh, at um, a steady state. So what we have at steady state is this equation for autosome. So the first term is just the rate of loss due to selection and back crossing to, to the recipient population. And it's balanced out by the second term, which is the rate of production due to splitting of larger blocks. And we uh, have also to add this contribution from migrants uh, considering uh, inch enter blocks when y equal l. So this um, uh, analytical expression for the, is for the autosomes. And interestingly, when you do the same for sex chromosome, you end up with the exact same analytical expression. The only thing is that you have to plug in different effective parameters. So for autosomes, the recombination rate, CA, selection coefficient, SA, and migration rate, MA, they are just the average between the female and the male component. But if you look at the sex chromosome, these effective parameters will change, and you have to consider the specificities of the sex chromosomes. So for example, for a recombination rate on the X, it's just half the uh, recombination rate in females, because uh, X and Y do not recombine in males. So you just uh, arrange this uh, equation with best effective parameters. And then um, we can show that um, uh, integration is really governed by two key parameters, the coupling coefficient, uh, theta equal S over C, the ratio between selection and recombination, which determines the extent of uh, coupling between incompatible alleles on the genomic block, and M over S, which determines the expected frequency without coupling of the incompatible alleles. So if we look at P bar, which is the equilibrium integration rate of the incompatible alleles, as a function of S, L, sorry, the number of our lo locus, selected locus on the genomic block. Um, and just note that CL and SL are kept constant. So on the left, you have a single strong barrier, and on the right, you have many weak barriers. Then I represented the first uh, order approximation with lines, with the analytical solutions and the simulations with symbols for di uh, different data regimes. So for high coupling, it's really clear that um, what matters is uh, what is the unit of selection is the uh, entire block, the genomic block, and so selection against migrant maintain a low frequency of the incompatible allele in the recipient species. On the other hand, uh, if you look at um, low data regime, so uh, weak coupling, recombination will be very uh, weak compared to selection, and so recombination will quickly break down your a big block into smaller block of weaker effects, and so you will end up with P bar much higher. An important point is that for all theta regimes, um, you can see that theta x equals 1.5 theta a. So this means that the coupling on the uh, uh, on the sex chromosome is much higher than on the autosomes, and this leads to lower integration of the incompatible alleles always. Uh, on the sex chromosome dot lines compared to the um, autosomes. You can have um, 
first order approximations also for the strength of the barrier to gene flow. So again, you have the same analytical expression for the autosome and sex chromosome, and you just have to plug in the different effective parameters. So now you have uh, the coupling coefficient that govern the strength of the barrier to gene flow, but you also have this alpha, which is the relative distance of the mutual marker to the selected block. Again, if I uh, plot the strength of the barrier to neutral gene flow, P, for different theta values, you can see that higher coupling from blue to red leads to a stronger barrier to gene flow. And then you also have this effect of the distance, of course, of your, your neutral marker to the selected block. So when the neutral marker is loosely linked to the selected block, it has more time to recombine away and to escape selection against migrant. So to sum up with this very simple model, what we can uh, say is that the sex chromosomes are stronger barriers to gene flow than autosome, and this is simply due to the absence of a combination in the heterogametic sex. I want to go into the details here, but you can, as I said, you can add um, sex bias parameters to look at sex-specific uh, processes like dosage compensation, acquiescence of sex bias migration. Uh, the important message to, to have in mind is that the effect of stronger sex barriers, um, sexing barriers compared to autosomes, this effect can be enhanced by certain type of sex bias, but it remains overall small on a factor of 1.5 to 3. The only case where uh, sex link barriers are much stronger than autosomal barriers is when you have incompatibilities uh, which are recessive and dosage compensated in the heterogametic sex. So here I show um, the relative strength of the barrier to gene flow for um, recessive, a recessive case, codominant case, a dominant case of the incompatible allele. And as you can see, uh, coupling on the sex chromosome is much higher uh, for recessive uh, incompatible allele uh, on the sex chromosome compared to the autosomes. And so this will lead to a much stronger barrier to gene flow. Uh, for example, a factor of 20 if you take a marker which is very closely related, um, closely linked to the selected block. So I think I have one minute to more or less to just um, finish telling you that um, we have a reprint with Imani on that subject. So if you're interested, in, uh, interested you can look at it for more detail. And I have just one more slide to tell you what I wanted to do with the empirical part of the project. So here the idea is to test the theory by estimating integration rates under a model of speciation in diptera. So we have a very simple model with one ancestor that splits into two species, and we can estimate then the parameters of the model, divergence time, population size, and what interests me really is integration rate between the species here. And then I would like to compare the average integration rate on autosome versus test chromosomes. And if uh, in average, I have systematically in many different um, uh, species per a low rate of integration on sex chromosome compared to autosome, then this may suggest that sex chromosomes uh, have a major role in speciation. So the idea is really to, to have a comparative uh, analysis with many species. So I will now finish by um, thanking Nick Barton and Mani for the theoretical part of the project, Patrice and Conrad for the genomic analysis part, ISTO Austria for hosting me, FWF for the funding, and you for your attention. So if you have questions, please. Thank you, Chris. Um, so any, anyone uh, on the uh, speaker panel should feel free to hop in with questions. I, I had one that I wanted to start with. Just so you said that when the connection between the uh, selected loci and the neutral one is not so strong that the, um, the single locus uh, incompatibility is a much stronger barrier to gene flow than the many weak incompatibilities. Did I understand that correctly? Um, I didn't show that because, yeah, sorry, here, um, what I have is uh, the case of um, a big locus, which is 100, um, um, which is made by 100 selected locus. So what I'm showing here just is um, on the X axis, the relative distance, this alpha value of the marker to the selected block for a case where I have a, a big block with many, many um, weekly uh, selected um, alleles. 
But in the the previous um Yes, this one? Yes. So, so mm -hmm. Uh so, yeah, go ahead. In that case, so yes, in that case, so I'm um just looking at the selected allele by itself. It's not a natural marker, but just ah. the natural allele. Yes. Sorry. It's a uh, yeah, I went from the one to the other a bit quickly maybe, but so maybe something which is interesting here is that for a single strong barrier, you can see that there is no differences uh, uh whatever the theta regime, which is blue and black and red, we are just overlapping. And this is because uh um, you have theta x, which is um, uh, higher than theta a, but ms, which is the same as m um, on the sex chromosome, is the same as ms on the autosomes. And so you would just have a difference uh, between the sex chromosome and autosome for multi locus barrier when the barrier is uh, made by more than one locus. Yeah. It's Chris, have, like, yeah, please. I have a question. That's Matt. Um, well, what kind of incompatibility allele are we imagining? Is it just a standard DMI? And does it matter where the pair is? Exactly. Is yes. So, um, so either we can just say that it's a um, dub schema incompatibility, but I'm just modeling one of the of the locus interacting. I'm, done, I'm not uh, uh, modeling the, um, the other uh, locus on the recipient species. Or we can just say that uh, it's um, like a non-dominant locus because here, uh, as I said, at least in the natural expression, um, I'm just considering um, heterozygous state. Uh, my, my, my incompatible allele is uh, rare, and so I, it won't be never in homozygous state in the recipient species. So it's the same like a non-dominant at the end. Or it can also be um, um, lo uh, locally adapted allele if we say that uh, you know the species one is in, in habitat one locally adapted and species two in, uh, in uh, habit, uh, habitat two locally adapted. So yeah, it's it's very I think general in terms of uh, the type of locus of bio locus. And that's it. We have um, a question from the chat. Um, I'm interested. If Elizabeth Gibson asks, how, "I'm interested in how much stronger the dominance effect is than others, such as sex bias." Do you have any more thoughts about that? Have you looked at the intersection of different scenarios? Yeah. So I went very quickly here, but um, so we look at a bunch of different um, sex specificity regimes. Um, so, for example, sex by selection, migration, acquisition, such conversation, etc. And so, really, when you look then at um, their, um, the prediction in terms of uh, coupling and uh, MS and how it translates to um, a barrier to gene flow, you really have small effects. So, I'm pretty sure it will be very hard to detect uh, uh, with empirical data because it's, you know, the barrier on the sex chromosome, it's uh, on the order of that in the, on, on the sex chromosome, on the autosomes. So 1.5 to 3, it's very small difference. So the, the real, um, the only big difference that we really uh, found was with recessivity and when, uh, of course, the neutral marker is close to the selected locus. Here we can have a 20 uh, times difference in the barrier strengths. So maybe here we can uh, detect something with empirical data. So yeah, 20 is, yeah, was the most one with. Great, okay, well, we should uh, move on. So uh, time for the next talk. Um, and you have another chance to ask uh, in the discussion. Okay, so Thanks. next up is Derek. Derek, can you share your screen? We've got Derek Setter, Derek Setter from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and he's going to be talking about sweeps in time, leveraging the, leveraging the joint distribution of branch lengths. All right, so go ahead and uh, switch. Unmuted. To the there I we go. It. There we go. Okay, sorry, sorry. So we need to just present this thing now. Are we good now? Okay. So yeah, thanks Daniel and Matt for giving me the opportunity to talk about this project. Um, so I'm gonna talk about sweeps in time, leveraging the joint distribution of branch lengths. So 
I want to start out with putting air quotes around the words linked selection because it's a, it's a term that makes some grumpy people really angry. Um, what it means is just how the genealogy at neutral regions of the genome is affected by natural selection, which acts at linked sites. Linked selection is a lot easier to say, and we'll stick with that because it's easy and it's short and we all understand what it means at this point. Today I'll be talking about positive selection. Uh, in particular, hard selective sweeps, where a new beneficial mutation arises in a single individual and then spreads through the population, dragging along neutral variation that's initially linked to it. Now, this effect of hitchhiking is mitigated by recombination as we move farther from the center of the, the, the what we call a selective sweep. And we want to be able to describe how this selective sweep uh, affects genetic variation. So we want to quantify how this sweep affects perhaps branch length information or the site frequency spectrum, but also how it affects associations among variants in the population, generating patterns in linkage disequilibrium as well as the, uh, the structure of haplotypes in the population. And all of this is really just trying to get at the question of how does selection affect the uh, entire ancestry of our sample or how does it shape the ARG? Um, so today we'll be focusing on branch lengths, and we want to be able to approximate the effective selection. So we use the Starlake approximation. It goes back to Maynard Smith and Hay in 1974, and it works basically like this. We assume a new beneficial mutation arises, and it follows a logistic trajectory to fixation. If we sample a neutral lineage that's linked to it at some distance r, we can describe its distance relative to the sweep center, so r relative to s and some log term for the population size. Looking at this single neutral lineage, two things can happen. Either it traces back to the haplotype that carries this new beneficial mutation, or it can recombine out, escaping the sweep with this probability. The star-like part of the approximation says, well, if we take a sample of n lineages, k of them, whoops, no, no, wrong way. K of them will escape uh, with a probability that's just the binomial sampling that one does. And the remaining N minus K lineages will coalesce instantaneously at the beginning of the sweep. Now, despite its simplicity, the Starlake approximation works really well for predicting genetic diversity. Here we can see that it does a great job of predicting the loss of diversity that we expect uh, around a de novo mutation in the panmictic population. And even when we add in population structure, uh, in the case of an adaptive introgression sweep, it still does a pretty good job of predicting mean genetic diversity around the sweep site. Now, these predictions can be extended to the site frequency spectrum at large, and these form the, the underlying model for genome scan methods looking for selective sweeps and genomic data. The original sweep finder method from 2005 and its many derivatives, including this shameless plug for our recent method Volcano Finder used to detect adaptive introgression sweeps. Now, these are actually really simplistic methods, right? Um, but they are actually kind of powerful. First, they're composite likelihood based and they're parametric, meaning they're computationally efficient since they have an underlying analytic model. And they do have high power to detect at least recent sweeps. So if we look at an example for Volcano Finder, we're asking what's the probability that we see an adaptive introgression allele as the most outstanding peak in our test statistic in the entire human genome if the donor population was a little bit farther distant than Neanderthals? Well, in this case, we do a pretty good job of catching the adaptive introgression allele as the most outstanding peak. Though there is room for improvement, particularly when the adaptive uh, sweep occurred sometime in the distant past. So we really lose the ability to detect adaptive introgression events, um, even though they make this really big pattern um, that's really obvious in polymorphism data, it's still hard to detect um, even some generations into the past. And this is due to two main limitations. First, that there's no parameter for the time since the sweep occurred in the approximation itself and that we're limiting ourselves to just the site frequency spectrum. The site frequency spectrum is really just, well, what's the mean branch length uh, of singletons or doubletons and tripletons in our sample? And we could in principle get more information from that whole distribution of branch lengths. 
in addition to throwing out that full distribution information, we throw out all linkage information. We assume that every site uh, adjacent to each other is an independent realization uh, of the process. And, and that's what we're stuck with. But we're going to ask, can we do more? We want to see if we can account for the time since the sweep occurred in our approximation. And we wonder, can we actually go beyond means, get to these distributions? And is there a way to capture information about this joint distribution of branch lengths? So to do this, we embed the star-like approximation into this general recursion for the genealogical history of a sample described by Conrad uh, and Nick in 2011. Here, we assume that the selective sweep uh, is instantaneous, really that it's uh, occurring on a, on a time scale that's very short relative to events on the coalescent. Um, and we also assume that it occurs at some single discrete generation time, TA in the past, before the selective sweep and afterward the population uh, evolves neutrally. And so we use this framework to to try to, to make some analytic predictions. And I, and I won't show you the details of the mathematics behind this. Um, it's a little bit tedious uh, for a short talk. Um, so we'll just jump right into looking at some results. So we'll start with a panmictic population. Here we're looking at a classic sweep scenario. And we're going to account for the time since the sweep occurred. We're going to look first at a sample size of two. We're going to plot the expected time to the most recent common ancestor as a function of alpha this distance from the sweep center uh, in the genome. Now we're using the time to the most recent common ancestor because it serves as a branch statistic dual for genetic diversity. So this alpha parameter, remember, just scales uh, the size of the sweep in the genome. It's a compound parameter of the recombination rate and selection strength. If we look at the time TA equals zero, this amounts to sampling the population right at fixation of the beneficial mutation, and we get this classic loss of diversity uh, entirely right at the site of selection. If we look at sweeps that occurred farther in the past, however, we see a rather dampened effect. Um, we don't see a full loss of genetic diversity um, and a diminished effect of uh, the sweep at intermediate distances from the, uh, the sweep center. Um, this actually kind of looks like a soft sweep pattern where we don't have a full reduction in genetic diversity, but in the perspective of a hard sweep, what this is showing us is how genetic diversity recovers over time as time progresses farther beyond the, the fixation of the beneficial mutation. So we've been able to account for this time since the sweep occurred and the expected uh, uh, time to the most recent common ancestor, but we can also account for it and include it in an analytic uh, formula for the full distribution of the time to the most recent common ancestor. So here we're plotting time on the x-axis and probability density on the y-axis. We're going to start at the site of the beneficial mutation here where alpha is zero. We're going to look first at TA equals one. So this is a sweep that occurred two n generations in the past. It's this little line here. So this dashed line corresponds to the neutral probability density function, which is just an exponential distribution with mean one, right? If we are at the selected sweep and coalescence occurs, uh, if we're at the site of selection and coalescence occurs before the selected event, sorry, before the selection event, then it will do so with the same probability that it does under the neutral model. At that time, TA, equals one, however, there's a burst of coalescence. Everybody has to find their common ancestor where at the site of the beneficial mutation and coalescence farther in the past can't really happen. If we are a little bit farther from the beneficial mutation though, we see that there is still a burst of coalescence. However, this burst of coalescence, this point mass that it generates uh, is smaller in size. And what we see overall is that there's a huge amount more information in this full distribution of the time to the most recent common ancestor than we had available to us just in the means. Now this worked for the case of a classic sweep, but one question is, can we actually still do these sorts of things when we add more complicated demography? So we'll take a look at this introgression sweep scenario from the Volcano Finder paper. Here we have, 
just an adaptive sweep that occurs from an introgressive variant at time ta in the past. And this comes from a donor population which diverged at some time ts or the time of the split um, even farther pastward. What we see is that the time since the split, uh, as in the Volcano Finder paper, it just determines this maximum increase in genetic diversity or this extension of the time to the most recent common ancestor. Um, so that, see, if we look at an adaptive sweep, if we sample right after fixation of the beneficial mutation, we get this really strong increase in diversity that depends on the time since the sweep. Similar to the classic sweep case, this time since the adaptive introgression event occurred, serves to dampen this response. Um, what's important here is that now we have an extra parameter. We have a uh, time since the population split as well as the time since uh, the adaptive introgression event occurred. And now even though we're, you know, I'm stretching it a bit, I'm trying to use genetic diversity to describe everything here, um, but we clearly can't handle two time parameters. So if we look at an example where TS is two um, and the adaptive integration event happened 0.25 generations in the past, it looks pretty much the same as if the divergence of the donor were twice as high and the sweep happened 2n generations ago. However, we can make more clear distinctions if we look at the full distribution. So as in the classic sweep case, the time since the sweep occurred determines just the location of this burst of coalescence in time, this point mass that we'd see. Uh, as for the classic sweep case, the time since the sweep and the distance from the beneficial mutation uh, alone determine the size of this point mass. What's unique is that here, the time since the sweep clearly has a different effect. It serves to push the distribution of coalescence times farther pastward. So if we take a look here, we've got a site very close to the beneficial mutation. The divergence time uh, of the populations are two uh, times 2n and the sweep that occurred 0.25 generations into the past. So here's our burst of coalescence. It doesn't matter which time the split occurred. Here, this dashed line corresponds to the classic sweep scenario. So the solid line shows a burst of coalescence. Under the adaptive introgression case, no more coalescence can, oops, no more coalescence can occur until they find a common ancestor, uh, which occurs uh, some, some time in the past, uh, which is clearly distinguishable between uh, populations that have very different divergence times. Um, okay, so I've, I've tried to argue that we can get more information out of these full distributions for branch lengths, but I've been careful to stay with a, a sample size of two and something very simple like the time to the most recent common ancestor. So. What I'll do now is take a look at a larger sample size. One of the limitations is that we can't actually get at the joint marginal distribution of branch lengths. It becomes too difficult to arrive at those results, but we can at least get marginal branch length distributions. Uh, because it's really complicated to look at all the possible different types of branches that can appear in the genealogical history of our sample, I'm going to dumb it down to just branches that are singleton, doubleton or tripleton types here in blue, green, and red. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to compare predictions to simulations. We simulated 10,000 tree sequences uh, under this adaptive introgression scenario. And what we do is we pick a distance from the beneficial mutation and we ask for each of these branch types, what is the per site branch length that we can record? And then we're going to take that whole distribution and compare it to what we can predict. Um, so what we can see here is that our predictions are, are actually pretty accurate. So uh, here we're very close to the sweep center, here we're at an intermediate distance, and here we're getting to be kind of to the right side of the, the volcano pattern in diversity in terms of distance from the selected site. Here we have the uh, introgression event just occurring, and as we move downward in these plots, uh, the introgression event occurred farther in the past. What we see is that there's all this sort of like weird, funky looking, like spiky stuff. And that's because we've aggregated branch length information over all these different types. But what I want to say with all this wonkiness is that we've lost all of this information uh, to the mean when we look at the site frequency spectrum. 
Uh, and so, yeah, we've embedded the star-like approximation in this general recursion that describes the effects of the sweep on the genealogical history of our sample. We've accounted for the time since the sweep occurred. We've allowed for additional demography. Uh, and we've gone beyond means to derive marginal branch length distributions. Uh, and as a future step, we actually want to get at this joint distribution of branch length, uh, which we have actually still lost. And we can do this by looking at the configuration of mutations in small blocks in the genome. Um, here we can see that the blockwise site frequency spectrum, which is just the likelihood we see you know, some number of singletons, doubletons, and tripletons in a single block, varies along the genome, and that even with a small sample size, we have a huge and rich data set. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Kachan Bichip and Conrad Loza, our advisor, as well as all the people in the Loza lab and friends. Thanks, Simon Martin and Matthew Hartfield for helpful comments and funding from the ERC. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Sorry, did I go way over time? Just a little bit, actually. OK, great. Um, so um, again, uh, someone want to jump in and ask a question first? I got one. Um, so yeah, have you, have you wrestled with like how to kind of decide how big a block to look at? Because you kind of, you need the block to be able to see that different, you know, kind of a distribution of, of different coalescent events. But on the other hand, you start getting recombination and these are actually different coalescent histories, not measuring the same branches in the same tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there, there is a, a fine art of drawing lines in this case. Um, so we will have to abandon, we're making the assumption that the blocks are non-recombinant in order to make any predictions about the site frequency or the block by site frequency spectrum. Uh, so if we see a recombinant in that block, it has a probability zero, the bigger the block, is the more likely we are to actually see a recombination event. Um, however, the bigger the block is, the more likely we are to get information. Um, it's not easy to make a decision as to what the block size should be. In principle, we're trying to get at information that's held in, in these in these configurations that actually have some mutations, right? So we can look at this this bottom line here. This is the blocks that contain uh, no variance, they're, they're monomorphic blocks. We could easily look at blocks that are too small and all the information we have is just from that and maybe a singleton lineage that has a mutation. Um, but no, there's no, there's no really easy, clear rule for deciding these things. It's just a matter of striking a balance between the type of data you have, say, this is a reasonable block size. I hope there's not too much recombination uh, going on in there that I'm missing. Ultimately, it's okay because you're sort of still averaging over the different types of genealogical histories, despite maybe there were recombination events in a block, but you didn't recognize it. Okay, uh, I want to get one question from the chat. Uh, Andy Kern asks, can you say something about the possibility of estimating parameters from the I guess, you know, underlying models uh, using the summaries that you showed? Yeah, so I mean, it would be Ideally, we would like to be able to say, you know, scan genomes and find these sites that are under selection. But given that we were to find one or we have one that we a priori know is under selection, yeah, it would be great if we can actually estimate these parameters. And, and like Andy mentioned, yeah, that's what's great about these parametric approaches that isn't so great about machine learning methods, right? Um, you can do this with machine learning and really sophisticated methods, but it takes a huge amount of computation time. Um, I think that it would be absolutely amazing if we could somehow construct likelihoods based on these full branch length distributions and somehow use reconstructed args and, and do magical things. But I do think that we can get at some decent parameter inference, even with small sample sizes, if we, if we use these sort of blockwise site frequency spectra uh, data. Um, in all honesty, I think that we can, you know, even using the site frequency spectrum with Sweep Finder, you can still actually get a pretty good estimate you know, uh, of these parameters, as long as you have decent data. It's a, it's a great question. I'd like to talk about more, but we should move on. Uh, so thank you, Derek. We can talk about it more in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so let's, sharing. yep, yeah. stop sharing. And now it's time to move on for uh, Kim Gilbert, who uh, is, 
somewhere in Switzerland in the process of moving from uh, uh, a postdoc at Lausanne to a permanent position at uh, Bern. And uh, take it away, Kim, please. Uh, great, can you guys hear me and see everything good? Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you both to Daniel and Matt for the invitation. So yeah, today I'll talk about um, work I did in my last postdoc at the University of Bern. Um, this is along with uh, Dr. Stanley Pie, Laurent Excoffier, and Stefan Peichel on uh, what drives genetic diversity in regions of low recombination. Um, and I think my introduction is probably a bit basic for this audience, but I'll go quickly anyway. So in general, a motivating factor for this study was um, what, what is a driver of diversity? This is a major question in evolutionary biology. Where does diversity come from? Um, and this is really important because diversity is what evolution needs to act upon. More diversity is better for many things such as adaptation, preventing inbreeding, depression, um, conservation, and survival of populations into the future. Um, and so this is still a large question. We don't know either across the genome or across individuals or populations or species what, what and when may be the processes that are most, um, most important under different scenarios. So there's still quite a bit of debate um, and a lot of people working on trying to understand whether natural selection is most important or genetic drift or when one or the other might dominate, um, as well as across the genome where one or the other might dominate. Um, and so uh, there's this observed pattern that Daniel mentioned very early in the introduction to the workshop, but that we see lower diversity in regions of low recombination. Um, this is observed in many, many organisms. So um, yeah, so these are just different studies showing the relationship between some diversity measure on the y-axis and recombination rate. And you can see in all of these, we have this decrease as we get to lower recombination at the left of each panel. Um, and this is across many organisms, though not in everything. There are some examples where we don't see this uh, reduction in diversity with lower recombination. But we think we understand this um, observation pretty well. Um, there's two general hypotheses. We have selective sweeps that lead to genetic hitchhiking, where there's a reduction in diversity around positively selected sites. Or conversely, there's background selection, which reduces diversity around negatively selected sites. Um, so to really quickly go through this for anyone who's not familiar, if we have a beneficial mutation, we can have a selective sweep that uh, leads to the increase of that beneficial mutation in the population. And if there's no recombination near to that site, any diversity linked to that beneficial site will increase and then we lose diversity around our beneficial locus. Um, and then the opposite for a deleterious site, we have background selection. Uh, if this star is deleter deleterious to, to fitness, then it will be selected against and along with any sites that are linked to it, they will be removed from the population as well. And again, we get a reduction in diversity due to this, <clears throat> due to this low recombination um, around the site. Um, so both of those, again, explain this uh, observation of why we can get a reduction in diversity due to low recombination. Um, but a project that came out of uh, Laurent's group previously looked at in humans um, across a range of recombination rates, a diversity measure called derived allele frequency and they found uh, a pattern that mostly reflects what we expected to see where you get this reduction in diversity as you go to lower recombination. But they had one small little increase in diversity at their lowest recombination rate bin. And this was a bit unexplained by the theory that we knew at the time. Um, and actually uh, at a conference, uh, I met with Brian Charlesworth and he suggested that maybe this is not just an artifact, this could be something called associative overdominance. Um, and so this is kind of what we set forward to investigate, what this associative overdominance could be and if it's what's driving um, a potential increase in diversity in regions of low recombination in, uh, in the humans in this case. Um, and so if you haven't heard of associative overdominance or AOD as I'll refer to it, it's been around in the literature for a while, but uh, uh, maybe a bit quiet in the background a bit. Um, but basically this is when we have deleterious mutations that are recessive and they arise in the genome and if they arise in regions of low recombination, uh, we get the opposite effect of what we saw before. So if this is a fully recessive mutation, uh, it will be selected against only in the homozygote state. And so it will be preserved in the heterozygote state once it arises, as there's no way to remove it in that case. Um, and so in that case, we get much more heterozygosity than it would have otherwise. Um, and this can lead to this increase in diversity, especially if we have this idea of many deleterious mutations perhaps arising over time we can get many, many sites that are uh, sort of preserved in this heterozygous state. And in regions of really low recombination, this can increase diversity. Um, okay, and so, yeah, so this, this study we wanted to see, can AOD actually be what's causing an increase in diversity in low recombination regions? Um, can it explain what was seen in this human data? 
Uh, and so, so I'm a mostly theoretical biologist at the moment, but um, I did simulations for this study in SLIM where we wanted to understand in the most simple, so, bleh, in the most simplistic scenario, um, can AOD explain an increase in diversity? Um, and so this was using a single population, a population size 10,000. Um, and we're only simulating here neutral and deleterious mutations. There's no beneficials um, being considered at the moment. And then the parameters that we varied were how strong selection was. So in a given simulation, there was only one selection coefficient for all the mutations. Um, then we varied recombination rate. Each individual was made up of six chromosomes and each chromosome just had one consistent and constant recombination rate from zero up to, cent up to 10 centimorgans per megabase pair. And then we varied dominance. So whether mutations were additive or recessive. Um, okay, and so to jump straight into the results, sort of as our um, control, we looked at the, the additive case. So this would be where we only expect background selection and no associative overdominance. Um, and we get exactly what we expect to see. So if we look at synonymous nucleotide diversity on the y-axis and reducing recombination rate on the x-axis across a range of strength of selection against deleterious mutations, um, we see that when we have the most, in, well, an intermediate level of selection, we see this reduction in this yellow line as recombination goes down. So that's background selection acting most strongly on intermediate strength mutations, a little bit less strongly on slightly more strong or slightly more weak mutations. And we see a flat line for very weak or very strong mutations. And that makes sense um, because for very strong mutations, they're so bad to fitness that as soon as they arise, they're knocked out of the population or for very weak ones, they're so minimal that they don't do enough for selection to care to push them out of the population. And so that's why those two lines are flat. Um, and this sort of pattern is matched by many papers in the past, including Hudson and Kaplan. Um, okay, so this made, it, made, uh, made us confident that our simulations made sense and we're doing what we wanted them to do. And so then we compared to the case where deleterious mutations are fully recessive. And so if we compare the same uh, measure of diversity uh, everything else the same except now H is zero, we see a very different story in how diversity changes across recombination rate. Um, we see many of these lines are now increasing, even one decreases and then increases after this light teal, um, except for this darkest blue case. So we do see now this increase in diversity in regions of low recombination, which should be due to associative overdominance when mutations are fully recessive. Um, and so that, that was cool. This means it definitely can be a thing, though these are still very simplistic simulations. But then we wanted to compare again to what we saw in the human data, and this was measured using a derived allele frequency. And so I'm gonna keep the panel on the right the same. Ah, sorry, and yes, this depends on strength of selection. And I'm gonna change the panel on the left because this, whether we see this or not, or how we see diversity change depended on what measure we use of neutral diversity in the simulations. Um, so this is uh, pi s. And then this is this derived allele frequency, DAFI, on the left. And you see a very different pattern for the same exact set of simulations. So this is the same output, just uh, summarized in a different way. Um, and we can clearly see an increase in derived allele frequency in this weakest selection case. But our, our light blue line or this teal line is doing something completely opposite. And it took us a while to figure out what was going on here because we didn't really quite have a handle on why sometimes we should see what we think is actually a reduction in diversity. But this was, as we found out later, quite simply explained by the fact that um, if we use pi, we're really measuring uh, heterozygosity across all the sites. And we have many, many heterozygous sites, especially in the case where AOD is strongest. But we can have those sites still be um, at really low frequency anytime they do arise. So that the derived allele frequency can still be really low. And so, um, so it, it made it a little, a little bit difficult in our minds to understand how can we try to find if AOD is going on in real populations um, if we're looking at measures of diversity. And so um, a co-author on this study, Stefan Peichel, did a really nice model um, for, for two loci. He also expanded this to multi-locus, but I won't go into for this talk. But basically, if we want to understand when associative overdominance happens, we can imagine that we have um, a wild type little b, little b, or little a, little a, um, mutations and then deleterious big A or deleterious big B that are only deleterious when they're homozygous. So only in the homozygous state do we have a reduction in fitness. And if these mutations are consistently entering the population, eventually we will uh, reach the case where, um, ah, I think I explained that poorly, but anyway, uh, so if, if it doesn't matter whether you're heterozygous or homozygous for this because these are fully recessive mutations, 
we can get it to the point where we've lost our wild type little a, little a, or little b, little b. And in that case, we end up here where we have just the heterozygote that is the most fit individual in the population. Um, because again, these are fully recessive deleterious mutations. And so in this case, this is what helps us to understand when we expect to see associative overdominance occur, depending on the mutation rate um, and how many loci we have in the population. And so, so this looks something like uh, this plot here, where if we have selection coefficient on the x-axis where stronger negative selection is to the right and weaker mutations to the left compared to our combination rate on the y-axis. Um, the colors represent the frequency of our wild type haplotype. And so in this dark blue area is where we have no wild type haplotype left. So we've lost the wild type. And in that case, we have that uh, heterozygous individual being the most fit in the population. Um, whereas over here, we have strong selection. So we don't lose our wild type mutation, um, selection can eliminate new mutations. And over here we have a combination that uh, can still prevent the loss of the fetus haplotype by recombining away different loci that have deleterious mutations arising. And so basically in this realm of intermediate uh, selection coefficients and lower recombination is where we expect uh, to most see this increase in diversity um, due to associative overdominance. Um, and so that helped us understand exactly what was going on in this process, and then to still try to understand if we could then observe it in empirical data. Um, um, ah, I have a summary first. Um, uh, yeah, so that shows us that it does depend on the strength of selection when associative overdominance should happen, and that this is most likely for intermediate selection and lower combination rates. Um, but then how can we detect this from, from genomic data that we have? Um, we, we looked at the site frequency spectrum to try and see if this could visualize the presence of uh, this increase in diversity in lower combination regions. And so for the next set of uh, plots, I'll show you, uh, it's a standardized or normalized site frequency spectrum. So it's showing you the deviation from the expected frequency if you had a fully neutral evolving population. So anything at this dashed line at one would be uh, what we expect the SFS to look like in a neutral population. Um, and so right now, this is an intermediate strength of selection. And if I show you the site frequency spectrum for simulations with three different uh, dominance parameters, we see for our fully recessive simulations, uh, this, this really large peak in diversity in a lowish frequency class, around 25, compared to these other two lines that are around the expectation or not showing uh, much of an increase in diversity. And so this this is super indicative of what we expected to see this associative overdominance increasing diversity at a given frequency in the population. And if we look across all of our different scenarios uh, that we simulated, we can see that this does still depend on the strength of selection um, and in an interesting way. So um, in this weakest case, so S equals 10 to the minus five, we have uh, maybe if, if you squint, you can see a very broad but flat peak, but basically we have really weak selection and there's many frequent heterozygotes across different frequencies, um, but there, this peak is maybe closer to 75 or so if you could say there's a peak in this flattish curve. Um, if you compare to the strongest, strongest strength of selection, um, the selection is too strong. This is where we don't expect AOD to occur. So these lines are pretty flat or below the expectation. Um, but if you see these cases where we have a much clearer peak as we get to stronger, more intermediate levels of selection, we have a peak of heterozygosity that's shifting from quite broad to being narrower and narrower and also to lower frequencies. And so this explains why we saw in our derived allele frequency that you can have really, really high diversity, but it's due to many, many sites at a really, really low frequency in the population. Um, and so, so AOD can sort of act in different ways of di increasing diversity. Um, at, at either, either across many loci at um, low frequency or some that are at higher frequency. And that affects our ability to detect it. Um, but we should, if it's strong enough, be able to see peaks like these in a site frequency spectrum. Um, okay, and so, so we can potentially detect AOD with the site frequency spectrum. Um, and I think if I have time, 35, maybe I don't have time. So we did also do a look again back in the human genomic data. My co-author Fanny Puyé did a nice analysis, which if there are questions I can talk about later, but we can see potentially some signatures of AOD. This, we need to look at this more because we'd used quite a small sample size at first, but um, we can identify some potential regions that might be due to either AOD or balancing selection, which is an interesting caveat. They both leave a pretty similar signature um, in the genome. 
Um, but basically, uh, the sort of bigger picture take home from this is that AOD could have a really strong impact. Um, if it does, it can confound scans for balancing selection. It looks exactly the same in a lot of cases that we analyzed. It potentially could interfere with FSD outlier scans if we're looking for locally adaptive sites, if we get uh, high regions of differentiation. But whether this is actually something that will matter in nature depends on a lot. So the simulations I showed you were quite simplistic. Um, this, what, what, uh, the way that organisms have uh, recombination playing out across the genome or how recessive mutations are or how strong selection is are all factors that are really gonna determine um, whether this is a, uh, an important process going on in nature or not. Or not, um, and I think some of these are questions that are still quite open in evolution. We try to understand better the distribution of fitness effects of new mutations, or how recessive mutations are um, all the time. And so, uh, there's also many organisms organisms where we don't really know uh, recombination patterns super well. So, hopefully, this is something we can understand um, much more into the future as we uh, get better at understanding those uh, those concepts. Um, Okay, and yeah, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my co-authors and other people from the lab in Bern, Brian Charlesworth and Vitor Salsa as well, funding sources, and if you want to see this paper is out in Current Biology uh, earlier this year. Um, and thank you again, I'd happy to take any questions. Thank you, that was great. And let me just start by apologizing for getting the direction of your motion wrong. You're actually starting at Lausanne, right? No, uh, well, it's confusing. So I was okay. in Bern, then I went to Lausanne, then, and I'm still in Lausanne, then I'm coming back to Bern. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so you are. So going you had okay, it right. Okay. It's not okay. a permanent position, though. So at some point, I will still look for a permanent position. <laughs> oh, ooh, exciting. Okay, yeah. so everyone, uh, you know, here's your chance. Um, so, um, quick question before I let someone else ask. So yeah, the, on on your last point, I mean, if you take an organism that's relative, yeah, I mean, relatively well uh, uh, known for these parameters, like Drosophila or something, mm. um, I, have you tried kind of thinking like how, w how often you would expect to see this effect there? So Brian Charlesworth and Hannes Becher have done a lot of work in Drosophila actually, and they see it, hmm, I'm, I'm going to be bad at remembering, but at least in two species, I believe quite um, quite easily. Um, they have these, these increases of diversity and lower combination. Um, and, but they're measuring it in a bit of a different way. They're mostly looking at singletons and maybe in the recent paper, they did also look at site frequency spectra. I'd have to double check, but it's certainly something you can see in Drosophila where we have enough data to look for it. Kim, I have a question, um, it's Matt. Uh, <laughs> is there any alternative evidence that there's AOD going on in nature? like? Alternate. Like instead of AOD, something else causing the same? Like, yeah, I mean, like, do, do we have a good example or any sense of how common this might be? Can we look for excesses of heterozygotes or anything? Yeah, but it's, I think it can be confounded quite easily with other things. So I'll just quickly show another slide because when we looked in the humans for what we would call candidate regions for AOD based on um, the site frequency spectra and a comparison of diversity and high and low recombination. We also picked up the MHC locus, which should be positive balancing selection. And you could argue that AOD is just a type of balancing selection. Uh, so it's a semantic thing there, I think. But, uh, and if we looked at simulations of balancing selection, so balancing selection is all the green dots here and all of our simulations of only deleterious recessive things are in the colors. And if we have H of 0.25, they're fully overlapping in terms of the differentiation we see for pi or for derived allele frequency. So it's something that's really difficult. Maybe some machine learning approach could try to train on something that we don't quite have a handle on yet. Um, or if you have really extreme AOD, we probably could detect it, but this is like a super extreme case. So, so far, I don't think we have a way to look just for AOD alone um, super well, if that answers your question. Um, but it could be out there contributing to what we see that we might be claiming is all positive balancing selection or something like this. Uh, Kim, I guess I have a follow-up comment. This is uh, Ivana. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, you should be able to actually estimate the, both the frequency at which you expect a variance to be enriched as well as the uh, high, uh, size of that peak. And so uh, I'm wondering with using that, you could also, uh, you know, estimate the effect sizes. Uh, oh, you mean like if you get the SFS and then you want to say how strong is my selection against some sites? How strong does it have to be 
uh, for for it at all to be visible given the quality of data and you know mm. given where the peak is how strong is selection and uh, and so on yeah I, yeah that would be something really worth looking into I think actually it probably could be done um, but yeah yeah <laughs> I have to think a bit more um, but yeah interesting point yeah well actually we should move on uh, thank you again Kim um, and uh, next up is Ivana. So last we have uh, Ivana Tsiovich, uh recently moved to Stanford. And can you go ahead and share your screen? Absolutely. All right, okay. So I'm going to give uh, you know, a, a completely theoretical look at what uh, uh, negative link negative selection or background selection does to uh, allele frequency trajectories and uh, and uh, and the site frequency spectrum. So this is work that uh, so uh, that I've done with Ben Good, Michael Desai, and Daniel Fisher. Uh, the first portion of the talk will be about the purely non-recombining non case, and that is already published. Uh, and then the latter part of the work uh, is uh, to do with a recombining model is, is actually even beyond the preprint as Daniel suggested. So uh, I'd be curious for any thoughts, comments and suggestions on that one. So a lot of what I'm gonna say is going to be very familiar at least in the outlines to uh, probably the majority of this audience. So because I'll be simply revisiting a classical model of link selection that has been studied for decades uh, but the point at which we diverge is we are motivated about thinking about modern data sets with potentially enormous sample sizes. And by thinking about these potentially enormous sample sizes, we realized that there were both conceptual and technical gaps that, uh, that we needed to address uh, to understand this problem. Uh, and so the model that I'm thinking of is uh, for now a model of a non-recombining chromosome that has some neutral sites and some deleterious sites. And when mutations occur at these deleterious sites, they confer a negative fitness uh, cost of S to the individual that carries them. And uh, you know, we're assuming that this is a strong enough cost that basically they're quickly purged from the population. And in this process, because there's no recombination, neutral, any linked neutral variants are also removed from the population. Uh, and so we expect that basically these sites that are linked to functionally important sites should also be under, have reduced diversity. Uh, so there's a very simple uh, heuristic that, uh, that, that, that you, you may have heard of that suggests that this process should leave a very simple signature. So because in the long run, any individuals carrying deleterious mutations have to be removed, then in the long run, the only individuals that can contribute to diversity are those that are free of all deleterious mutations. And as a result, the prediction of this verbal argument is that the diversity should look like that of a neutral population with a smaller effective size equal to the number of mutation-free individuals. So what does this mean specifically? This means if you look at a statistic of the genetic diversity, like the site frequency spectrum, the distribution of polymorphic allele frequencies in the population, uh, Neutral theory tells us that this should decay as one over the frequency. Uh, and so even in the absence of selection, we expect more rare variants than common variants. So the verbal argument that I outlined on the previous slide suggests that at each frequency, uh, the allele frequency spectrum should just be simply proportionally reduced. So I can just go ahead and simulate the model from the previous picture where I have a pop up population of fixed size at which uh, neutral and deleterious mutations accumulate and are selected upon. And I get a very different picture. I get a site frequency spectrum that agrees at intermediate frequencies, but then there's also an enormous success of both extremely rare and extremely common variants that very much disagrees with this reduced any picture. So I'm not the first one uh, to, to, uh, to, to point this out uh, at, at all. And it's long been appreciated that actually this, uh, this excess of rare variants is typical of uh, expanding populations, as well as this sort of non-monotonicity in the site frequency spectrum being typical of positive selection. And yet we see it occur in simulations in which the population size is explicitly fixed and there's no positive selection. So what is going on? 
We reasoned that because the verbal argument has to be correct in the long run, then uh, whatever is contributing to this effect must be happening at some shorter time scale, uh, time scale than, uh, shorter than the overall time scale of coalescence. But before I move on and explain this in any more detail, I want to point out that because these uh, distortions are limited to very high and very low frequencies, then approximations that ignore them would have actually been fine in historical data sets because they only become prominent in larger samples. And yet at these larger sample sizes, you know, methods that we have to predict diversity under background selection, including the structure coalescent, become very computationally expensive or uh, and other approaches become quite inaccurate. And so, uh, and so let's, let's go back to our model and think about, so concretely I'm thinking about a population of fixed size N at which the Lothurius mutations accumulate at some rate UD and all have the same effect on fitness S. In this, uh, under this model, you can classify individuals in the population according to the number of deleterious mutations that they carry. This completely predicts their fitness. In any population, you should have, ha have a class of least loaded uh, genotypes that selection aims to maintain. When deleterious mutations arise in the background of these genotypes, they create less fit individuals. But as long as the deleterious mutation rate is smaller than the rate at which selection removes these individuals, you will have a predominantly neutral population with mostly neutral uh, mutations and, uh, and, and a completely neutral site frequency spectrum. And so in this case, mutation actually has no impact on the, uh, on the site frequency spectrum. The much more interesting case uh, occurs when the deleterious mutation rate is uh, larger than S at which point uh, you end up at steady state establishing a broad distribution of fitnesses in the population when the population reaches stable mutation selection balance. And this is, this is the only case in which anything interesting occurs. So I'll look into that a little bit more uh, closely now. So a lot of the, so what we do over here is, you know, we calculate uh, to calculate the site frequency spectrum as well as uh, what, what, how alleles behave and what trajectories they take. We calculate the full distribution forwards in time by modeling the allele as a couple, coupled branching process where coupling is provided by mutation. I will not talk about this at all, but instead I'll just give you an, an intuition uh, as to what is actually happening. So. A lot of the intuition can actually be gained by ignoring the, uh, the quite critical effects of drift, which, which, uh, which we do treat fully, but just thinking about the deterministic dynamics. And deterministically, what we know is that basically all alleles that arise in better than average backgrounds are actually positively selected in the short run. And so the allele, alleles that arise even in genotypes with loads do positively, do increase in frequency on average uh, shortly after arising until the load that they uh, accumulate further uh, causes them to, to go extinct. And so in backgrounds that arise, in permutations that arise in backgrounds without any load, uh, these mutations can quite rapidly increase in frequency uh, as they attain their own internal mutation selection balance. And uh, mutations that are founded in genotypes with some load do in quite quickly reach very high frequencies but are then uh, purged from the population. And the fr frequency that they reach actually ends up quite sensitively declining with the uh, amount of original load. And so this, this intuition is already enough to sort of revisit some of these features of the allele frequency spectrum. So I mentioned mutations that arise in, in, in the unloaded background. These mutations can potentially fix in the population as long as they fix among the least loaded class of individuals. So mutations founded on these very rare backgrounds can be found throughout the site frequency spectrum. Uh, there are even more mutations that arise in backgrounds with a single deleterious mutations. And though these must go extinct eventually, they, in the short run, they can reach quite high frequencies. Similarly, uh, mutations arising in backgrounds with more deleterious mutations can rise to each even, even more limited frequencies, all the way until at the very lowest frequencies, we see mutations from all backgrounds uh, uh, present in the population. Basically, anything can be present at frequencies one over the uh, uh, the, the effect. Uh, sorry, the, the the fitness independent of how unfit it is. 
And so as we go from high frequencies to low frequencies, what we see is an increasing number of contributing individuals, a true sort of increasing frequency dependent effective population size, even though the whole process is, is, is not neutral uh, and there are other effects that, that, that contribute to this rapid decline. What this also means is that if you focus on for example, mutations found at say 50% frequencies, you will know for a fact that these mutations must have arisen in the most fit individuals in the population back at the time, even though at the time of sampling, they are present in, uh, in, uh, ac across backgrounds of all fitnesses. Similarly, uh, mutations found in this band are, uh, are, are, are guaranteed to be uh, founded by uh, or most likely to have ancestors that had no more than one deleterious mutation in their in this segment at the time. So, uh, so this 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 brings us to the other interesting feature of the site frequency spectrum, which is which is this sweep sweep like a uh, sweep like signal that we see at very high frequencies. And I've told you already that to reach these high frequencies, you must have arisen in the least loaded background. In fact, what we can show is that to reach these high frequencies, you must fix among the least loaded individuals. And at that point, if you think about it, what's happening with the wild type is now the blue wild type allele is fully linked to some deleterious load. And as a result is being purged from the population as the purple neutral allele performs a true selective sweep, in, uh, even though it does not have any inherent fitness benefit. Um, and so, what, what this means is also that if we looked at the uh, if we looked at the population and observed uh, 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 and observed the site frequency at some some time point, we would be able to predict with confidence that these mutations are in the process of fixing in the population and will deterministically replace the wild type allele at some point in the future. Uh, and so, by carrying out the full stochastic calculation, we can actually uh, calculate the full uh, distribution of allele frequency trajectories as well as the form of the site frequency spectrum uh, in, in all of these different frequency ranges. Uh, and so what we find is that, for example, this structure up to this logarithmic factor, the structure that we find at the low end of the, uh, of the uh, frequency spectrum is identical to what you would see in the event of a recent exponential expansion. The structure up to this logarithm again, the structure at the top of the frequency spectrum is what, what occurs in the presence of isolated sweeps. And everything except this intermediate regime occurs in the presence of rapid adaptation. So very simple models can actually produce quite, quite a range of complicated behaviors that could quite easily be uh, confused with uh, more unusual or more interesting, I would say, phenomena. And so in summary, what I've told you is that, uh, that background selection can lead to dramatic distortions in the allele frequency spectrum that can look like population expansions or even positive selection. And that these distortions are present whenever the deleterious mutation rate is larger than the uh, selective coefficient. And so at this point, we can sort of go back to our original uh, picture and revisit what went wrong in, our, uh, in, in the quick heuristic argument. Uh, by reference to the overall distribution of fitnesses in the population. So initially, we started by assuming that only mutation uh, individuals can have descendants. This is only true. This is true, but only in the long run. They can only fix. Uh, and instead, we've seen that uh, all individuals can contribute to some portion of the site frequency spectrum. This led us to conclude that the diversity should look like that of a neutral population, but with a smaller effective size, which is also true, but only in the limited part of the site frequency spectrum. And finally, we've seen that fundamentally non-neutral behaviors occur, uh, including these sweep-like signatures. Um, and, 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 and as sort of a, a, an interesting tidbit uh, and, 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 and a potential way of constructing statistics that actually can distinguish between different scenarios, we found that the mutation frequency can be used to predict both the ancestral background and the future fate of the mutation. So, so, so far I've talked about a completely asexual uh, chromosome in the absence of recombination. And in the long run, what we really want to do as, and understand as a field in order to understand sort of the effects of link selection in recombining organisms is a full linear model at which we have, in which we have link sites at which mutations can occur uh, at, some, uh, at some rate and which recombine at another specified rate. We are not there yet. 
but what I what 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 I will talk about uh, for for uh, for a few more moments is sort of a first step analysis that also refers back to one of these classical Hudson and Kaplan models, where what you have is a distant neutral locus that is linked to some more tightly linked conserved region experiencing negative selection. Uh, this can also actually be this 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 type of model and ends, ends up also mathematically resembling what you would want to write down uh, as a model of horizontal gene transfer in bacteria and so uh, and so and, and so it's and, and so it it applies to a range uh, a range of organisms and so uh, so here what, the, the the basic message over here is that uh, the effects of recombination are are quite complex and depend quite subtly on the uh, rate at which recombination occurs compared to all of the other forces shaping the population. Uh, but that quite a lot of recombination is is needed to make the picture fully sexual, and that very little is needed to make it fully asexual. So if you look at as a function of the recombination rate, the important scales are the uh, the fitness uh, the deleterious fitness effect size the overall deleterious mutation rate which I've already mentioned and a third important effect uh, scale ends up being the variance in fitness in the population and so at very low recombination rates when r is smaller than s we find that the dynamics are predominantly asexual even though for the purposes of the diversity there are important connection corrections that cannot be ignored to get completely neutral night dynamics, you need R to be larger than the overall deleterious mutation rate. Uh, and when it's even a little bit lower, you, you already see distortions uh, in the site frequency spectrum at very low frequencies. The most interesting regime is the one where R is between uh, S and sigma. And here we see these novel sweep-like dynamics that are seen neither in the sexual nor in the asexual case, where um, and, and, and a key feature of these dynamics is that even alleles that are linked to deleterious mutations can persist on very long timescales. But recombination on, on uh, better backgrounds can cause these dramatic jumps in frequencies that are very rapid, but then pause uh, at, a, at a set frequency. All right, so that's, uh, that's all that I had. Uh, I think I might pause now and take any questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna jump in, and you know, I've been asking all the questions, about it, but it's okay. I got, I've, I've got one that I really want to ask here. Uh, what about if the focal allele itself is under selection? Yeah. So if the focal allele itself is under selection, even, even in this case, actually. So the, the corrections over here at very low recombination rates come from, uh, from, uh, from, from rescue of the, uh, of, of the population. So. So in, in, in principle, even if the focal allele is under, uh, under selection, it is, if, you know, you can, you can think of it as, as just having a fixed additional fitness cost and, uh, and, and it sort of ends up being, uh, it ends up having the same dynamics as something that arose in a, in a background of high fitness, except it cannot recombine that cost the weight. One more question from the panel before we move on to the full discussion. All right, then. Oh, well, so let me just—I mean, let me just follow up on my question. So, I mean, you know, in the—is there a simple way to describe it in the asexual case, where oh, you in say the like? Asexual case is very simple. Yeah. These alleles are limited to frequencies basically below here. Below but can, can, can you can I give you a selective coefficient? You tell me, aha, it experiences kind of an effective population size of this much. If you gave me uh, so so yes, in, in, in not really, no. Uh, so I could tell you this is the frequency that it is able to reach, mm. uh, you know, if it arises in the best background and we can describe its trajectories, but the, the trajectories at the low part of the site frequency spectrum have are, are completely non-neutral. Mm -hmm. There's nothing effective about uh, about that process. Okay, thank you. you know, maybe maybe I have another question. Sorry, Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the distribution of fitnesses of all the chromosomes that we're imagining, if I start to think about recombination, does that distribution have to apply to a single non-recombining region? Do I have to be able to capitulate that huge distribution just within this one block? And then I 
recapitulate yeah. it again within the next block? Yeah, so in here, in, 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 in this picture over here, that ends up being that ends up being given, that distribution is ends up being unaltered by the fact that you're uh, linked uh, to uh, uh, a horse. Uh, in in general, it is it is unclear actually even what the overall distribution of uh, of fitness is would be in a in a fully linear model where recombination can happen uh, happen anywhere. The relevant picture is, you know, on the relevant timescales on which you are going to be alive, how long is the block that, that is unlikely to recombine at all? And because we have very important processes happening at very on very short timescales, these blocks can be quite long, even though there might be recombination events in the population uh, on, on very short timescales, length scales. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, we got a question from somebody. From Go Dan ahead. Falouche, yeah. Um, he asks uh, that, okay, yeah, classic theory says that uh, Moeller's ratchet is dissipated by a small amount of recombination. Uh, how? What's the connection between that and uh, these results? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll reshare my screen. Yes, uh, we do actually see that so when I say predominantly asexual, I mean uh, the trajectories are predominantly asexual. So if you follow the population in time, uh, you would not you would not see uh, any. Um, it, it, it would look like there was no recombination going on. But even a small amount of uh, of, of recombination is actually able to rescue quite a quite a large uh, number of, uh, of of the alleles arising in bad backgrounds. So our, our results, the, even though our results are in a limit that is not ratcheting, uh, the sort of the insights are, are qualitatively very consistent with this uh, with with this picture. Okay, uh, Matt, you want to get us started right. on the uh, discussion now? Well, I'm supposed to lead the discussion. Um, and I thought if we just step back, th this was great. It was four great talks. And from my stepped back 20,000 foot view, we had a talk that talked about link selection and its effects on migration or the interaction with migration, the interaction with adaptation, the interaction with balancing selection and the interaction with negative selection. And I guess my question for all of you is, and Daniel brought this up at the beginning, what, what hope do we have for a single theory that includes link selection, right? Like e each of you have been able to dig down into this one little aspect of variation and it gets really complicated in every case. So like, what does the big picture look like to each of you? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> My perspective is that we're really quite at the beginning of, of this process. You know, we're able to sort of awkwardly reason through these very simple uh, toy models. Uh, and and we're, you know, the moment you look at any one of them, you see there's all of these unexpected things that, 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 that take, some, uh, take some, into, some novel intuition. Uh, I, I think that, there's a lot of work to be done, but I, th I think the, I don't, I, I think, I do hope that ultimately we are going to sort of get a piecewise understanding of, you know, what are the important effects? At what scales do they matter? Uh, you know, how, uh, how do they compete when they, you know, so for example, with, with negative, in the case of negative and positive selection, it is actually not very difficult to see that you only need a very small amount of positive selection to sort of over, uh, overwhelm the signal of negative selection and to lead to rapid adaptation rather than sort of a static picture. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so I, think, I think that a lot of progress will be made by very carefully quantitatively studying all these separate scenarios uh, and then bringing them uh, together later. Don't be shy. We brought you here to like learn from you. Well, okay. Well, I mean, I mean, my feeling about it, I guess, is that yeah, it would be great to have some sort of grand unified theory of positive sele of, of selection acting in genomes and how that 
combines with neutral processes, but it's tough. I, we are all just scratching the surface on our individual little teeny tiny portions of this problem. And I think it's tough to also move on and try to come up with a, a sort of more, say, nuanced or, or intricate understanding of all of these things together. I don't think that we're actually ready for that at all. Um, I think what we kind of have to do rather is focus on how how we can disentangle these a little bit, right? I, I think Ivana, you sort of said, if you look at these things and how they affect everything sort of individually, we can try to look at pairwise effects. Um, but I, I think that in sort of in the long term, uh, we do have an actual genome that has things in it that experience stuff differently. And I think that's sort of maybe the hope for us is to try to disentangle things with respect to functional differences and annotations in genomes and say like, okay, these sites experience some things, these don't, um, and maybe move from there. I think Derek, an interesting point following your uh, comments is that uh, it, it could be interesting to classify this, uh, this forces um, in a conditional, uh, or unconditional process. So, for example, you are talking about adaptation, um, uh, but with mutations that are globally adapting. And maybe uh, Ivana was talking about uh, globally deleterious mutations, but uh, you can also have more context dependent um, uh, mutations where effects are context dependent. So, for example, balancing selection or uh, what I was talking about, the deleterious uh, mutation only in the recipient uh, species background. So, yeah, maybe we also need to take into account this um, environmental effect, which is ecological or genetic. Uh, that can also um, varies. So yeah, try to classify a bit of this uh, different forces, I think. Let me um, read Dan, Daniel Felucia's question because I think it's related to this and maybe Kim can start as an answer. He said, um, what are the most tractable, tractable natural systems? And I think I'll expand upon that by saying, is there one system, you know, classically it's been Drosophila melanogaster that we can study all of these forces in or does it look like we have to pick a different system for each force we want to look at? I don't know if we would need to pick a different system for each force, but I'm quite certain if we looked across different systems, we would probably see at least somewhat different effects. Because I think, I, I don't know, I'm not super up to date on what recombination maps look like across different species, but I think there can be a lot of variation and that alone is going to change a lot of how linked selection is acting um, in populations and in the genome. And so I think we have to look across many systems and whether the ones that are most tractable will teach us the most, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, there might be some really unique things out there that we would learn that we just don't know where to look quite yet, perhaps. Um, at least that's how I feel about that. I think that there's also some danger in picking you know, what is the ideal data set? I mean, Drosophila is great. There's lots of data. They have huge population sizes, which is great to answer some questions, but um, but but really not others, right? I mean, I can't take a look at sort of a uh, insecticide resistance in, in, in Drosophila and talk about a hard sweep. That doesn't really make sense. And if I want to look for an example of a hard sweep, I'd have to go somewhere else. Um, and so I think you have to really focus on yeah, make sure you're answering the right types of questions with the right types of data, which you get from the sort of right types of organisms or organisms that have an, uh, a natural history that we understand and, and can recognize. You're muted. <laughs> uh, this whole notion of an ideal data set is, I think, still quite confusing to me because, I mean, my, my perspective is that actually we are, we still do not know what would be knowable, a perfect data set. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, and so, and so, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly not at the point where we can do any kind of parameter inference reliably. And this, uh, this, uh, this perhaps sort of addresses Ilya's question uh, in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, I think you know we're we're still sort of in in a stage where even getting broad and a broad understanding of 
just the broad features of distinguishability of dif different models based on different statistics is uh, is still a, a very big open question. I mean, I, I did notice that um, I guess Kim snuck some data in at the end and Chris motivated it with data, but there wasn't a lot of data. I mean, do you think that, that that's because of this limit that we can't estimate many parameters in real, in real life settings? Or, I mean, you can throw any statistic, any statistical inference tool at any data set and you will get a number. But I don't think that that's quite what we're after, right? Like I, like if, you know, if we could figure out the full DFE distribution of effect sizes and, you know, distribution of headers, like whatever, say that someone gave you that answer, would you be, would you be really satisfied? Is that, is that it? Wrap up, close the field? Or I would imagine that, that, that it's something subtly different that we're looking for. So you wouldn't take it if I gave you the DFE? Like who would take it? Somebody must want it to. I would it. take it. I would be, I would, I mean, I would, I would I mean, it's a start, it. come on. I mean, I think any of those, it's an, an observation at a point in time and that's super useful to have, right? But if we try to understand the process that generated whatever DFE someone just handed me, that's a, a separate thing from being able to infer what it is at that point in time or at that location in the environment. Like uh, we were just discussing that this can change depending what environment you put something in. So. Yeah, I think it's two things we have to consider what we can observe, what we well, what we can't maybe yet observe, but what we wish we could, and then how to understand what generated what we're observing. And therefore predictability into the future and things like that will follow. Well, maybe I'll try to spin it more positively. So Ilya says, so we can't yet predict the diversity of real populations, can we? And I would say actually we do a pretty good job, right? I mean, we all know the details, so we're arguing over some stuff in the tails, but if you show me the size of the organism, I could take a pretty good guess at what nucleotide diversity is, right? I don't need to know more than that. A good ecologist or even really anybody who can like look at an animal or a plant can tell you what the amount of diversity is. So, I mean, how bad is it? I mean, I'm not sure I, 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 uh, I agree with that. We know that as those are empirical facts and we have noticed patterns and we are able to, you know, use those lookup tables that, you know, appear to have a simple structure, as you say. Uh, but uh, do you really understand why the pairwise diversity in, you know, in a certain organism is X and not tenfold larger or tenfold smaller? I, I, I certainly don't, but... Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'd, I would do pretty well in elephants versus mice. And I think I'd have some idea about why that is. And I think if there was an outlier, so let's just pick orangutan as an outlier, right? It has much higher diversity than we'd expect. And then we explain that. We say, well, it must have been through a giant contraction recently. And we look at its historical ranges and we say, yes, that those contracted. I mean, I think if you're, if you're allowing me to guess within an order of magnitude or infer within order of magnitude, I think I could Pretty close. Let's say that you colonize a new planet and, you know, saw, saw a population and you saw that, you know, it numbered about 10 million as best as you could guess from your uh, spaceship, right? Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I think I don't so know. that's a good point. And I think that, um, you know, in that case that what we care about is not pi. So I think that's what I would try to defend it with like, I don't really care what the number pi is. So if I went to a new planet and you said there's an organism and there's 10 million of them, I couldn't tell you what pi is, but I could tell you that the other organism on the planet with only a hundred thousand individuals had a lower value of that measure. That's fair. And, and if they had recombination, if they were having sex and there was recombination, I could tell you again, it's not universal, but it's about as good as Haldane's rule that, uh, you know, the lower the recombination, the lower the diversity. So I, I think we can predict things. Okay, um, let me see. Oh, Joe Lachance says, we need more than just the DFE. We need the distribution of dominance coefficients. Of course, um, 
So now I give everyone all the dominance coefficients and the DFE. <laughs> what else do we need? I mean, what are the other really, really important biological parameters that we need? I think I would like uh, some demographic parameters as well, like to know the history of the species. Um, yes, mm. fluctuation of uh, population size and if they migrate, if they are uh, structured populations. So yeah, then it's quite hard maybe to disentangle both um, the selection and uh, demographic history. I mean, if you're asking what we need to understand, it's every single parameter we have to put into the simulations, right? That's exactly what we need. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. I, I, yeah. um, okay, so let me back up and ask a more general question again, which maybe I can guess the answer to, but a, a few of you have touched upon parametric methods versus, let's just call them simulation-based methods, whether they're machine learning or not. Um, you know, what's the way forward? Why do we have both of these existing? If we, with say SLIM or something like it, we can simulate everything. We don't need theory. What's the tension and the balance there between these approaches? So can we simulate everything? Right, it's, it's no. just not clear. What do you even simulate, right? I mean, the parameter space is so large. What is the haplotype structure of the population? Where, you know, what, what are the shared, what is, what, just, what is the full haplotype structure of all of the individuals? Does that matter? How does it matter? On what scale does it matter? So I don't think that, I, I mean, I think that the issue is that the parameter space is enormous and there are all of these, you know, all of these different scales and, you know, which would make a physicist cringe. Uh, because there are, you know, all of these important processes happening on, you know, on very, very different times, uh, time scales at the, you know, uh, at, in the same uh, and so, and you have these, you know, fluctuations mattering an enormous amount. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, and what this ends up leading to is there end up being all these symmetries in the end in the problem where you know it doesn't matter, it matter if you increase s and then uh, you know and, and decrease n at the same time, and so I think the danger with trying to you know even in principle trying to devote a supercomputer to all of that and simulate everything is that you know you might actually be just simulating the exact same thing and not really exploring you know even even the most important you know just being stuck in a very tiny part of parameter space. Anyone else? I mean, it's important to also remember that these these analytic models give us insight as well. I mean, having having the ability to say, like, I see these effects and I see them coming from this process and being able to name it and describe that is really, really useful. And I mean, you can do this as well by can just simulate the same thing um, and and do this algorithmically, but it doesn't feel as good. It's not like as wholesome, like spiritually. Um, and I think that one of the big problems is that these heavy simulation approaches, um, they're, to be honest, I mean, like I, I've seen it where like you can actually just simulate and get get answers out. So like, I'm gonna make analytic predictions about all these blockwise site frequency. It's faster to just use SLIN and simulate it than actually calculating it. It can be. Um, and so, well, I don't know, what do we do with that? I think that the point is really like, there's, there's a different sense of purpose to these two things. Um, and I mean, I, I'm, uh, parametric methods for life dog. I mean, like I, the, these sort of like uh, really heavy computation simulation procedures are really great and, and really cool uh, and terrifying in a way uh, like the additions lose their jobs maybe, but um, I still think that there's a place for parametric models and the insight that we get from them. It's interesting that you should say that, Derek, because I mean, your um, approach was kind of a, a non-parametric approach, but not simulation-based, right? I mean, your your um, 
this was uh, Andy's uh, kind of question, right? That you, you're inferring these trees, but without a parameterized, you know, um, demographic model uh, that would produce them. Well, so uh, I guess I'm not following, but I mean, we do have, you know, there's an underlying demographic model. There's a pendictic population. It does its thing and there's a sweep. Uh, and we predict the effects of that sweep on these genealogical histories. It has parameters and it's analytic. I mean, it is, it is that. Okay, sorry, I, okay. I, I, I misunderstood, yeah. but you, you can imagine going the other way. So that you start with data and then rather inferring a parametric model, you infer something about the distribution of trees. Mm. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> bit specific. Brain fart, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, so we uh, we're getting uh, okay, and and Andy says, yeah, okay. I'd I'd offer that anal analysis for simulations of false dichotomy. We need both as a field, of course. Boring, boring. You know, <laughs> trying to be reasonable. Um, after Matt got everyone riled up. Okay, so um, ask the question if that was the answer I wanted. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we we said that we would um. We would wrap it up here. So um, I just want to thank all the speakers, uh, my co-organizer, Matt, uh, Tierra, uh, and the rest of the theory and modeling of living systems at Emory, and once again, uh, NSF polls uh, for support. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one. Tune in next week. <laughs>